grab it here. So, running retro Commodore stuff without the hardware. And um, why would one want to do that? Well, actually, real hardware has its own issues, and um, there's a few of the highlights of that. It can be hard to find, and sometimes it can be very expensive for such old equipment. And um, you also you need um, physical space to store the equipment. You can't just have it in a very bad um, location because it'll just deteriorate even further. So and that can be an issue. And they are actually big and clunky things often. So don't, they require quite a lot of space. And um, often with this 30 plus year old hardware they need so always some kind of repairs or or um, they can be turned out to be just inherently unreliable. That's one of the reasons why home computing of those days was scrapped because they, they were never <laughs> reliable. <laughs> and um, also they often, it's not only the actual computer but often to make it useful you need to have a, a whole pile of accessories or extra equipment. I mean this could be a floppy disk drive, a disk drive, um, a hard drive of some type, uh, adapters, cables, you name it. So it can actually um, explode um, when you actually just get the actual um, legacy hardware then you find out that I can't use it before I get all this extra stuff. And um, in some instances you may need to actually upgrade it so there are certain um, areas like keyboards and, and mouse handling and stuff that may actually require that you um, you spend money on upgrading certain parts of it to make it useful. So, um, what's the solution for this? Well, um, there's lots of talk about virtualization, so um, that's actually one of the solutions that you can use to actually get access to the majority of the Commodore hardware experience without actually having the hardware. And the good thing about this solution that I've found is the um, you can basically use any current PC hardware that you have lying around. And I would say any computer that's, uh, let's say, the five years, not more than five years old. Uh, even I think older computers will also. But, let, but let's just throw out a budget figure, five years. And so it'll probably do absolutely fine with this solution. So let's take a look at it. So, anyway, the product that I found is called um, Amiga Forever, and I'll put the um, URLs in the comments. And then you have um, actually several different editions. So you have the value plus premium, and then some other options. And I um, thought we'd just actually have a quick look at the product comparison. So, here we have the different um, packages. And um, as you see, the value edition actually that's the one that really uh, um, you lose features. So basically, if you go to the plus edition or premium edition, then you uh, actually get the um, pretty much everything that's included. But I decided to go for the premium edition. I mean, you get some additional video, historical video content, plus the access to um, uh, physical media. So here's the um, premium edition, and as I said, the, it's um, quite nice the one actually um, gets the physical medium, so you get a, an actual box with um, let's see if I can show it with the DVDs in it. So you actually get a physical backup for what you have purchased. Don't get that rule <laughs> very often. But of course, it's not actually mandatory. But I kind of like it since I'm prone to losing digital stuff. So it's actually nice to have a physical copy. But I mean, I think this is the best overall package that I've seen. And um, this has a large collection of um, different Amiga hardware emulations. And, and most importantly, it has variants of the or, you know, Kickstart ROMs and um, different workbench versions, so you can like combine and even customize the um, configuration you want to run. And it's also very easy to use. So there's uh, you just install it, and then you're up and running. So there's little or no requirement for actual um, setup or configuration if you don't want to do it. And um, yeah. It, it's not free, um, 
but I mean you get what you pay for in usability so since you're paying a bit of money then you actually I, I think that one gets a kind of a nice nicer streamlined experience than trying to download emulators standalone emulators on, you know online and then having to dig up the ROMs and the workbenches and can get the configurations right and, and get the games to work and stuff so it's, uh, yeah so I, I think if, uh, from an overall perspective I think this is the best package I also have a uh, C64 Forever um, package, and this is more orientated towards like Commodore 64 and older hardware. So it does not only contain the Commodore 64 emulation; it's got lots of the, of the uh, legacy um, hardware going back to the PET uh, Commodore PET. Um, so that's what the, this. Is. So if you're if you're mostly interested in in Commodore hardware. Uh, affiliated or or uh, being sort of history of the Commodore 64 going back to the vet then this is this is actually a cheaper and better package and if you actually pick up the um, Amiga Forever premium package then you get this this actually it, it's not thrown in but you get it at a cheaper price so I, I actually uh, also invested in in this package and um, one of the issues yeah it's not an issue but <laughs> For this review, that I, that I, I actually installed both, and then started looking at it, and I think the problem is I can't really I can't see right now after I've installed it exactly what's included in in um, the Amiga Forever Premium Edition versus the Commodore 64 Forever Edition. So I, I would have to I would have to guess that. Um, the Amiga Forever, uh, you get the Amiga stuff, and then when you install the uh, C64, then you get the C64 and the older hardware emulations and other media installed. But I'm not sure, but they seem to kind of act as separate. But um, just as a comment for, for, for this review, that I, since I have both installed, it's maybe, maybe what I'm going to show now is not um, your experience if you only install one or the other. So oh, I just thought we'd take a brief look at each of the um, editions. So this is the C64 uh, Forever, and um, here you have a folder, CBM file. And this is the thing that I'm not sure if you only buy the C64 Premium that if you get this Amiga section. This Amiga section might have come when I installed the Amiga Premium, so then it's like shared between the clients. So just as a side comment, but. Um, as you see, it has a quite a wide selection of different um, uh, Commodore hardware emulations, uh, starting from the PET and um, you know, your Big 20. So, and then you do have a, a subsection of games and a lot of demo scene stuff and applications. This is actually just a terminal emulator. And then um, there's a little bit of uh, like news articles and stuff, and then there's some, um, yeah, some videos, and um, of course there's like blended in also Amiga media. So uh, again, I I think that maybe they're sharing data between the two packages. So. But anyway, let's have a. It's take way too much time to go through all the details, but I just thought we'd um, start a Commodore 64 session just as an example so anyway here's a Commodore 64 and um, <laughs> for those that are familiar with this yeah and um, I'm just going to make one one still small demo here so we actually have um, copy paste support from the key keyboard so, so you can make a program and then you can uh, Use your standard keyboard to actually run it. <laughs> Hello. Um, as I said, it would take way too long to go through all the details, but it um, uh, you can save the state of this machine. So if you're working on it, then you can actually save it um, and then come back to the same state. And that applies to all the virtualized machines. Um, it does actually have a media emulation support. Um, like you can add a, a tape drive, a, a disk drive. Um, it has um, mouse emulator, uh, mouse and joystick um, pass-through, so um, 
you can actually connect in joysticks and I'll be coming back to the issue of joysticks uh, in a later video so um, but anyway it's as simple as what I showed you so you just um, pick the machine from the list and um, say play and then you, you've got your machine and then you can do whatever you want to do with it including configuring it against the external virtualized environment so what I thought is I'd just uh, show a, a game startup and um, see what that looks like so, so starting a game is just as simple as going to the games list and then you can select the game and then it's just to click right click on it and then you get a menu and then you can say play So here we get the classical load screen of Commodore 64 games. <laughs> classical Commodore 64 sound. Don't hear that much noise. So I just press the space key, which is the fire key. But um, I and, and coming back to this joystick issue, I, I'd say 99% of the games they require a physical joystick, so either a PC compatible or an Amiga compatible or a Commodore compatible joystick. And as I said, I'll come back with another <laughs> video to cover that subject. So here you get the copy protection loading that those of our generation are familiar with so you know I think this uh, most of these games were originally delivered on tape so you had a copy protection system and then you always get these hacked by cracked by <laughs> good old days when we used to copy games right left and center. but these uh, games that I'm showing here they, they actually have been copy protection removed by the with permission of the publisher so we can get some copyright so in that perspective that's good the, or it's good with the with the package that you get by default the, the, all those games are being copyrighted so let's see decrypting or redoing the code to be able to run it. As you see, that it's um, the hardware emulation uh, and accessory emulation is simulating the, the the speed of the original hardware, so it's not accelerated. And this is where, it, as I said, the um, the actually need because now even the space bar stops working. So, so, but I mean, practically speaking, you can't use the games if you don't have a joystick. Actually, I haven't really figured out if there is an option to play the joystick or the keyboard. I think they might be able to figure out. I mean, obviously, the easiest way is to actually have a so anyway, that's for the Commodore 64. So here we have the Army 
go forever. Uh, I don't know if you look at the system supported, and there's a quite wide range of Tomica products, and even the CDTV version, and then uh, the 4000 PowerPC version, and uh, a Waker prototype also included. So it's quite a but I thought what we'd do is just to get a general idea of what this is about, and um, they're, they're all pre-configured, so it's just to start and play like we did with the Commodore 64, but I thought we'd actually have a look at the Omega 500 and the related um, configurations, just to give an idea of what, it, what one can, if one is interested, adjust. I mean, based the way they designed this, is a, it's a generalistic environment for any kind of emulation, but um, if we just go through some of the more interesting stuff. So this is for Omega 500. So we'll look at the details. So you can... That's extras. Ah, oh, there we go. Configuration. So here for example you can choose what ROM you want to run on it. Um, what level of compatibility, what CPU you want to have, lots of different choices. Do you want to run it at an original speed or faster? You know, then you can change around you know, memory and, and speeds and, and then di different um, emulations for um, parallel serial or power piece and you know, stuff. So you can actually connect virtualized devices to the instance. Um, videos, options, PAL, NTC, so yeah, a pretty wide variation of different stuff. And then here in the media thing, the the idea here is that you can um, you can um, define the floppy disks that are connected. You can have up to four floppy disks drives connected, and then um, there's options for um, setting up hard uh, hard drive emulation also. And then you can pre-configure what media is. Um, loaded into the system before you boot it. So in this example I've added another the extras disk for the workbench on as a second disk drive. And then we have a little bit options to um, configure for input. And I'm going to be later playing a little bit more around with this um, joystick uh, options and see if there's a if there's a way to make pure, purely virtualized joysticks so you could actually have it through the keyboard and not actually have a physical joystick, but obviously the physical joystick is the is the best way to go. But well, we'll take that uh, in the upcoming video. <sighs> then you can configure actually what types of port setup it has. And of course, one could argue why would you do that for an Omega 500 change the different. But I mean the the operating system uh, Kickstart Workbench. I mean, basically, you could you could um, have different number of different things, so you have the options to change it. And then there's some level of automation so that you can actually get the machine to run certain um, scripts when it starts up or uh, to um, to activate certain things in your environment. So anyway, I just thought I'd give a brief overview so you can actually go and tweak the Omega 500 um, setup uh, if you find that interesting. So let's start up the Omega 500. That's the simplest. Right-clicking on the machine on the system, and then, um, selecting play. Oh, wait, I have to close the con config window. So no, right-click and play. No, I just to speed up things, I didn't um, uh, record in the um, workbench loading the boot process. But anyway, now we're in the workbench, and as you see, I have um, configured um, an extra, the extras disk as the second um, floppy disk drive. So we have the workbench just to show that it actually works, and you actually have simulated disk sound in the background. So the speed, as I said, the speed is as per the original hardware, so it's not accelerated. And we take the clock, classical clock. 
Well, so this is your Amiga um, 500, and um, then I can do Amiga 500 stuff just like one would do on the original hardware, and one has the options um, with the different media and the port connections and everything one can configure. So one can actually pretty much ah, do do quite a lot of what one would do with the original hardware. Just loading the game Aerial Races just to show that one can actually get games working. Right. Also, easy to start the game is just to start the game. <laughs> right click and play. I immediately see that they're much more advanced graphics compared to the Aerial Races before. And again, the issue being, of course, is that. Uh, Need a joystick. Otherwise, you can't use these games. Uh, I haven't. In the, I mean, of course, there's probably games that you can actually work on the keyboard. So mo most of them need. I thought that even actually even if you have retro hardware, uh, I would think that this is actually a good complement to have because it's actually a very quick way to test software and, and, and understand quickly test how different things work and then you can actually go to the hardware and do the same thing. Or if you have a problem on the hardware with some software, then you can actually test it in the emulation and then um, see if you actually have a real problem with the hardware or not. So, uh, and this is actually a very good way to support the community. Um, I think, you know, supporting companies that tr try and keep this stuff above water is actually quite important. Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's never going to be big business, but um, yeah, maybe we can keep some people employed and, and having a happy time. And then also it's good for us hobbyists also, there are solutions out there that we can actually, actually, actually use. So, um... Yeah, so there's as I said, follow up video on, on the joystick side because that seems to be a very important thing to have. And um hope you enjoyed this one and I'll see you in the next one.